Hello and welcome to the next lecture for our class. Today we will talk about the American West. There are a few themes to be addressed in this presentation. First of all, we'll talk about how the national government had a major impact on the development of the American West, particularly with the railroad industry, settlement by different pioneers, as well as policy toward Native Americans. What you want to be able to do is to evaluate these policies to determine whether you think they had a positive or negative impact on the nation's history. We'll explore the steps that led to the Transcontinental Railroad first. Beginning in the 1850s, U.S. territory extended from the Atlantic to the Pacific Ocean, and many people supported a transcontinental railroad that would link the nation together. But there were several barriers in place. Can you imagine trying to build a railroad across the Rocky Mountains or huge rivers like the Mississippi or the Missouri? You can see that map on the left that identifies those geographic barriers. On the right, you see levels of rainfall, the yellow areas, uh, demonstrate areas where there was less than 20 inches of rain a year, and those were di very difficult areas in order to live. Railroads sounded great. However, there weren't very many people living out west, and there weren't a ton of people trying to go out there to establish farms in those areas where there was low rainfall. In order for the railroad companies to make money and to, to pay for the huge cost of building those rails, you needed to have people take the rails and there was a lack of settlement out west and so the national government had to step up in order to provide incentives for companies to build that transcontinental railroad. Just as it took the a massive program sponsored by the national government to to have the space program and to put someone on the moon, the national government stepped up and passed legislation to encourage the construction of a transcontinental railroad. We see that with the Pacific Railway Act, which passed in 1862, which authorized two companies to oversee the construction of a railroad. This map identifies the system of railroads in the United States for throughout the 1800s. There was an extensive system in the east of railroads, but what we see is where that red arrow is pointing, that's where the Union Pacific Railroad would start their construction, and they would go westward. And then the blue arrow is pointing to where the Central Pacific started, near San Francisco, and that would go eastward. The two railroad companies would meet somewhere in the middle. Because the cost of construction was so incredibly expensive as an incentive for those companies to become involved, the United States government provided free land for those companies. For every mile of track that was built, the companies would receive 10 sections of land. But later, that was expanded to 20 sections of land uh, because it was just so darn expensive and difficult. By the way, one section of land equals one square mile. This map identifies the so-called checkerboard pattern that was uh, adopted by the United States government. What the government would do is on either side of that railroad track, there would be one square mile that the government would give to the railroad company. And then they would hold on to the next square mile. Uh, and then there would be another square mile that was handed out. 10 miles on either side of the railroad tracks would be handed out to the railroad companies by the federal government. The companies also needed access to cash in order to pay all the bills, whether it was laborers or if it was the materials in order to build the railroad tracks. They received between loans, these were loans from the government, between $16,000 and $48,000 for each mile of track that was built. If it was a flat terrain, then they would only receive the loan of $16,000, but if it was traversing a river or if it was in a mountainous area, they, their loan value would be $48,000. Although there were some issues with the Pacific Railway Act, without those government subsidies, there's no way that the railroad would have been completed so quickly, and it had a major impact on the U.S. economy and society. With all that government money being handed out, well, there were some issues. In some cases, the tracks were actually built way too quickly, and there was a lot of shoddy work. Subcontractors didn't always meet the specifications that were necessary. 
Also, sometimes those surveyors who were to try to determine if it was a flat terrain or something that was mountainous, well, sometimes they were bribed by the companies uh, in order to get a better interest loan. And so there was some corruption associated with these government subsidies that were handed out. There were also many labor shortages. In the 1860s, something important was going on in the United States. The Civil War. And so the Central Pacific actually adopted some unique recruiting activities. They actually advertised in China to try to get Chinese laborers to come to the United States. Also, some members of the Mormon faith who were already out there in the Utah area uh, also were involved. The Union Pacific encouraged Irish immigrants, and then after the Civil War, former slaves as well as Civil War veterans were encouraged to work for them. Although there were problems associated with the Transcontinental Railroad, by 1869, those two companies met at Promontory Point in Utah. A trip that had once taken maybe five or six months could now take five or six days. Railroads were arguably the most important industry in the United States in the years following the Civil War. They had a huge impact on society. You know what? We never had time zones before the 1880s. Today, the national government has implemented time zones, but the railroad companies, a private industry, actually established the first ones in 1883. And you see some examples of this here. The railroads also had an impact on the environment. This had a huge influence on the number of buffalo out west. Prior to European contact, there were millions of buffalo in the American West. Well, by the 1880s, those once plentiful buffalo herds had actually dwindled and they almost became extinct. There were a range of factors. One would be that buffalo hunters were able to make a lot of money by killing the buffalo and harvesting their hides. These images help to tell the story of the loss of buffalo out west. On the left, we see several buffalo that had been hunted. On the right, we see buffalo hides as well as their heads as trophies. Some additional factors also influenced the decrease in the number of buffalo. In order to feed the laboring crews that were working on the Transcontinental Railroad, the, the companies themselves often hired hunters to kill the buffalo and to provide the meat for those workers. Also, the U.S. government had an incentive to try to decrease the number of buffalo because by killing the buffalo, it undermined Native Americans' abilities to resist the increasing number of settlers out west. We'll talk in more detail about U.S. policy toward Native Americans a little later in the lecture. The government also encouraged settlement out west by offering free land. The Homestead Act was passed in 1862, the same year as the Railway Act. Any adult, citizen or non-citizen, could select 160 acres of surveyed but unclaimed land. Remember that map that I showed earlier, the checkerboard pattern that where the land was handed out to the railroad companies? The pink areas here show one square, square mile of land that was handed out to the railroad companies. Well, the kind of greenish or grayish areas where the, the arrows are pointing, those were these were square miles of land that were held onto by the national government. Well, th it was these stretches of land that were subdivided into 160 acre plots that were available for people to, to get under the Homestead Act. There were some requirements if you wanted to get this free land. First of all, the land had to be occupied for a minimum of five years. It also had to be improved. And by improvement, that would be cutting down the trees, planting crops, building a house, things like that. As long as someone went along with these requirements, after five years, the land was theirs for a very small fee. The impact of the Homestead Act was tremendous. As you can see here, it allowed over 400,000 families to become landowners, many of them for the first time. And a lot of these people were actually immigrants coming from other countries. I was lucky enough to do some research at the National Archives once, and I saw an example of a homestead contract. 
Here we see what this one is from 1886. Notice the name where the arrow is pointing. This was a homestead application made by a guy named Charles Ingalls. Has anyone ever read the Little House on the Prairie books? I thought this was really cool when I saw this at the National Archives. Charles Ingalls is an example of only one homesteader who moved out west. On the left, you see an advertisement for free land in several states. Once they got there, some people realized there weren't many trees, and so conditions actually could be pretty rough. On the right, we see an image of someone standing in the doorway of his sod home. This was a home built out of dirt. While many people were successful as they took advantage of the Homestead Act, others faced problems. Rainfall levels in many parts of the West were actually quite lower than in other parts of the country. This map provides a close-up of precipitation levels in the United States. The blue and green areas of this map indicate areas where rainfall might be as low as 30, but maybe 40, 50 inches a year. Well, you only needed 160 acres in order to make things work out or make ends meet uh, uh, if, if, if you had high levels of rainfall. But notice the yellow areas of this map, particularly like in the Great Plains in the far west. Well, in some of those areas, they had maybe 10 or 20 inches of rain. You needed more than well over 160 acres in order to make ends meet there if you had a farm. Those low levels of rainfall were only one problem. If you wanted to make ends meet, 40 hours a week wasn't going to cut it. Maybe you would have to expect 80 or more hours a week if you were going to make it out west. Mosquitoes and grasshoppers were really annoying and could destroy crops. On the top here, you see a drawing of people trying to kill a lot of grasshoppers as they were threatening their crops. The heat and humidity in the summer was unbearable. Then in the winter, there were more extremes as often you would have heavy snowfall and blizzards. On the bottom left, hey, you see some prairie dogs, which are really cute but they also could be an obstacle if they came um, and they started to attack some of your crops, as well as maybe if you had a horse, if it was to step into one of those holes, um, it could break a leg, and that could mean the difference between starving and not starving throughout uh, the winter. People also suffered from those sod homes because of the lack of timber. So going out west was really tough. While some made it, Others didn't, and some research was done to try to determine, well, what was one of the factors that allowed people to be successful if they took advantage of the Homestead Act? Well, to be successful, you probably needed at least an additional $1,000 to buy more land, to bring irrigation uh, and more water to your crops and things like that. So yes, this was successful in many ways, but not as successful for everyone. We'll now explore some policies developed by the United States relating to Native Americans out west. This map identifies the different culture areas occupied by Native Americans at or about the time of European contact. Historians estimate that maybe 10 to 12 million Native Americans lived north of Mexico in what is now the United States at this time. By, the, by 1900, there were only about 500,000. Interaction between Native Americans and American settlers often led to conflict. You see the circled areas on this map identifying the Sand Creek Massacre in the 1860s, the Battle at Little Bighorn in 1876, as well as the Nez Perce Retreat. In previous years, Native Americans had been forced to move to different areas in the American West. If you're familiar with the Cherokee Trail of Tears, they ended up in what was originally called permanent Indian country, then it was called permanent Indian territory. Today, it's Oklahoma. It was eventually opened up for settlement for non-Indians, and originally it had been set up as a so-called haven for displaced Native Americans. Two groups actually came together to develop a new policy toward Native Americans. 
One group wanted to save Native Americans, and they were so concerned about the number of Indians who were being killed that they worried that they were going to be wiped out. Another group simply wanted access to Indian land. Ultimately, those two groups supported legislation referred to as the Dawes Act. The goal with this legislation was the forced assimilation to Native Americans into American society. As the government itself put it, the anomalous position heretofore occupied by Indians in this country cannot much longer be maintained. Indians must conform to the white man's ways peacefully if they will, forcibly if they must. For years, Native Americans had been forced onto reservations, as identified by the green areas here. The goal of the Dawes Act was to literally break up those reservations, force Native Americans to integrate into American society, and with, if any land was left over, then to open that up to settlement for non-Indians. Under provisions of this act, each Indian head of household would receive 160 acres of land. If there were additional family members, they too could receive an additional 40 acres of land. I've done some research on some Wisconsin Indian reservations. One was the Bad River Reservation and the other was Lac de Flambeau. Both were located in Wisconsin. On the right, you see a government settlement pattern. What they did was they divided those reservations into 160 acre plots and then handed them out to individual Indian families. Did you know that there had been an Indian reservation in Mason County where the college is located? One was in Custer Township, and today you can actually go to a so-called Indian cemetery located in Eden Township. Additionally, participation in this program was mandatory. Now you might be saying to yourself, Native Americans are getting free land. Why would it have to be made mandatory? Well, as a result of this program, it was devastating throughout Indian country because by about two thirds of all tribal land was lost between 1890 and 1930 when this act was discontinued. The reason for this is because once that land was allotted to different Native American families, anything that was left over was opened up to settlement for whites. So Native Americans didn't want to participate, but it was made mandatory and it had a devastating result. The government also sponsored a series of schools called the Carlisle Schools. These were government-run schools where Native American children were taken from their families, some in some cases voluntarily, but in many others, they were forced away from their Native families. Uh, and they were brought to these boarding schools where they were forced to assimilate into American society. Once they were taken to the Carlisle School, they were not allowed to speak their native language. They also had to change their clothing. And in, in the image that we see here, we see this young man who had to have his hair cut uh, and he was he went from his traditional clothing to wearing Western style clothing. The idea was to kill the Indian yet save the man uh, and have this younger generation assimilate into American society as a long-term program. In the 40 or so year history of the Carlisle School, over 10,000 children were enrolled in this program to force them to assimilate into American society. But the Carlisle School was not the only program with this set of goals. There were several other organizations that enrolled thousands of other children. Again, the idea was if you focus on this younger generation, then they would become so-called Americanized uh, throughout this education system. Native Americans reacted to this set of policies in different ways. Some Native Americans became committed to a new religious movement called the Ghost Dance. On the right, we see an image of Wavoka. He was an important Native American sachem from the New Mexico area. He preached that all whites would die and dead Indians and buffalo would return to the earth, but only if Native Americans adopted a few new policies. First of all, they had to live together peacefully. Second, they had to abandon so-called European or white influences, particularly drinking alcohol. 
And they also were encouraged to dance a particular dance. The ghost dance included many traditional songs and some newer ones. And it became popular particularly among the Sioux living in the Dakota territories. Because it was seen as such an important example of Native American resistance, it was outlawed by military authorities. However, tension between Native Americans on the Sioux Reservation really increased as Sitting Bull, as shown here, was killed by authorities who tried to arrest him late in 1890. As U.S. cavalry was rounding up several Sioux warriors near Wounded Knee Creek, a standoff occurred uh, between some of those warriors and members of the U.S. military. It's unclear who fired the first shot, but the result was the massacre at Wounded Knee. About 300 Native Americans were killed, including many women and children, including seven infants. 29 American soldiers also died. In many ways, this conflict at Wounded Knee was a low point for Native Americans as they had lost a tremendous amount of territory, loss of life, loss of culture, and things like that. However, what we will see throughout the course of the semester is there was a resurgence throughout Indian country when it came to Native American religion, culture, and issues like that. And just as African Americans were involved in the civil rights movement, we'll talk about AIM, a civil rights organization associated with Native Americans. If you're interested in learning more about Native American history, I would recommend a really good book called The Heartbeat of Wounded Knee, by David Truer. Well, let's review some of the highlights of today's presentation. Today, I've tried to talk about how the American West was transformed in the years after the Civil War by a series of policies adopted by the United States government. What you should be able to do is you should be able to identify the provisions of each of those policies and then to evaluate. Do you support or were you opposed to these set of programs adopted by the U.S. government. That's it for today. I hope you learned something new. Over the next few slides, you'll see some of the sources used for this presentation. Have a great day, everybody.